So, yeah, I was, I was, um, I wanted today to talk to you about. Uh, it, it's really common that um, so I'm just going to be diving in like this. So, I don't know if you see this image. So this, this image was one of a set of images that came through on um, to us uh, via you send it last week from um, Ghana from a photo shoot that we've been. Um, coordinating for ACFO. It's football for water. I don't know if you can really make it out, but it's, it's, a, it's a school, and this is a team of people who are using ACFO tools to do really cool stuff. And um, this arrived in our, in our inbox. And um, I mean, they're amazing photographs, but what I really wanted to talk about today was the sort of um, the, the legacy of work that's gone on to get computer technology into a position where we can do things like this easily now. Um, because it, it's really easy to take this stuff for granted, um, but it's amazing technology. And I, I wanted to kind of step back today and uh, take you through some of this. So, Charlotte, I don't know if you could move the slide on as well. Is that, is that, is that <laughs> so, I, I was born in January 1971. Um, which is one year before a computer processor was launched called the Intel 8008 processor. And um, so I'm basically about the same age as the personal computer industry in, in, in its current form. Most of the, the PC industry was actually uh, sort of driven out of California in the first half of the 1970s and was actually a follow-on from a lot of the engineering work that went into the space race in the 1960s. So as the space race came to an end, I mean the space race was really about who could build the biggest rocket but make it politically acceptable. Um, and that's where you know, let's put a man on the moon, but meanwhile we built an enormous missile by the way. So, but the, the space race really led to this amazing depth of engineering talent, in, particularly in California. And um, a really great book I'd recommend is, is, by, is called I Was by Steve Wozniak, who's one of Apple's founders. And it's a really nice, easy read, um, but it's all about how he grew up in the orchards of Cupertino, California, and, and, and his dad used to bring home electronics, which he played with. Um, so a lot of the technology industry sort of was driven out of California. But I actually come from uh, northwest England. Uh, so this is a, I come from a town called Fodgham, which is uh, on a hill um, overlooking the River Mersey. And uh, Fodgham has two distinct features. One is that it has this really nice wooded hill. Um, and, well, and then you can see this right across the Mersey estuary. Um, and then this enormous chemical plant sort of pumping out all this sort of fumes. Um, but we have this beautiful wooden hill, which also had a nightclub on the top of it. And this, remember, this is the mid to late 80s, so this is proper swinging disco lights and, and, you know, dry ice and everything. So, yeah, we lived in this little town, but it had this nightclub on the top of the hill. So it's a pretty, pretty good place to grow up. Um, now, the, the thing is, there was a really distinctive culture in Britain in the 1980s related to computers. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of that now. Um, so, yes, yeah, so if we go on to the next slide. So, the first basic thing, right, so who, who knows the difference between um, memory and storage on a computer? I'm not Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> you really don't know, do you? Okay. Right, so there are three things you need to understand about computers. One is the processor. And that's kind of like the brain, how it's, you know, it's, 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 it's smart, how powerful, it, it, it's, it's doing all the number crunching. And then you have um, some, so you get like an i5 processor now, or Intel i5, or something like that, or AMD. The other thing was memory. So memory is, is the sort of thinking space that the computer has to do its processing in. Yeah? Um, and then the, the third thing is storage. And storage is where, how much space is there for the computer once it's thought about things, where can it store files and information? So the, the computers have always been about a battle, like a, a, a sort of, as the processes have developed and as the memory has become cheaper and as the storage has become cheaper, things have become 
more powerful. I mean, you should never rush out and buy a computer now because next month it will be more expensive because that just doesn't happen. Yeah, there's always something newer, with a faster, better processor, more memory, cheaper storage. So anyway, that was just the three facts. I'm not going to go into any more technical stuff for the rest of it. Well, actually, I probably will. So yeah. Okay. So. The rest of this is just products that I think have been particularly interesting and have had a particular role for me in my work. So I'm, I'm, I work for ACVO now, but I'm for the computer industry. I'm not an international development person at all. Uh, just, that's not my background. So I, I worked, I started working in the uh, computer industry for Apple in the early 1990s and then went on to work for Compaq and Hewlett Packard and, and some Dell and some other companies. So I've, I've kind of worked in the industry for quite a long time. Now, this computer was the first, it's called the Apple II, and it was launched in 1977. And it was the first computer that, that broke the dominance of the old data processing IT department. Before that, you used to have um, punch cards and big, you know, big computers would be in a, like a room over there, and it would have tape drives going around like this. If you wanted anything, you had to ask the the data processing people to process it for you. But this computer changed things really significantly. It was, it was just about affordable enough for an executive to put it on expenses, and it's still a lot of money, like thousands and thousands of dollars, and bring it into work and just put it on their desk. And it ran, um, especially, I think it was VisiCalc, but it ran on the first spreadsheets. And spreadsheets are a genius thing that most people don't use for the right reasons now. They tend to, you know, use them to you know, like word tables in, but it should actually be it's about calculating things. So this computer was really, really significant. And it, it's really what helped Apple to take off. So um sure not. Right. Then something else happened in around through the mid-70s, Intel had been really improving the quality of processes that performance processors. And this is the um, Intel 8086 processor. Now, the, the clues are the 86 at the end here, because this, this processor, which is the brain of the computer, yeah, went on from 1978 to dominate computing throughout the 1980s and into the, well into the 90s. So it's all, um, it's called the x86. So it's everything that Microsoft Windows is built on, everything DOS was built on. It's all this sort of the, the Intel 286, 386, 486, Pentium, all of that was built around this process and it was a really important step in everything we've seen since. Okay, that was... Another thing that was um, that happened, so Apple was doing really well um, with this, this Apple II that was quite sexy and but, but it IBM, meanwhile, didn't like the fact that its old its business, which used to be all about data departments uh, through the 70s, was being threatened by this upstart computer. So IBM came back by launching this in 1981. And I, I guess you can almost recognise that as a PC, as a, as a computer that you might have had on a desk at some point, maybe. So this, this, this really went on to become very significant. It was the first PC. And it was based on that processor that I pointed out before. And um, crucially, what IBM did was it did a deal with Bill Gates um, because it needed to write an operating system for this very quickly. And um, it, it allowed Microsoft to write the operating system, and, um, which was called MS-DOS. Um, and, um, and because of the way that everything was ended up licensed, it became possible for other computer makers to build copycat computers based on this. And that's really when we started to see the expansion of, of, the, um, of the PC industry. Is that a double flop? I think it is, yeah. yeah. So go back. <laughs> right, so, yeah. So copy from one to the other. So, yeah, you used to have, so, because, so that's, that's storage, yeah? So right. of the thing, so it's, this is the storage stuff. So where you have a hard drive now, um, yeah, you used to have these big, fabulous, floppy, floppy disks, like five-inch ones that, like, and, and yeah, you put them in there. And then you could copy between the two, because <laughs> this wouldn't have had a hard disk drive as well. It just had the floppy drives. I, I had it. Oh, well, I'll tell you about that later. So there's something else in a minute. Actually, so this was the first computer I had, um, which my dad bought in 1982. 
and it was um, called the BBC uh, microcomputer. <coughs> um, at the time, there was um, in in the UK, the, the BBC was going through. It wanted to launch a TV program that was about the computer revolution, and it wanted to commission a computer that could go alongside it, and that could could eventually be sold in schools. And um, it took this really seriously and actually went out and commissioned its own design. And this is the result. And there was, I can't emphasize how much this, what role this computer played in 1980s IT education in, in the UK. There is, there is no British kid that did not use a BBC computer in the 80s. So I'll just um, play you a little video, hopefully, in theory. Oh, I forgot to put the sound on. Maybe it's loud enough. Maybe it's not, actually. For this, the information technology year, uh, BBC Two begins a new it's series now that explores the world of information okay. science in the computer program. Right, so this is so this is the program that, that launched this. It's quite fun. So I forgot to bring my big speaker with me. You may have noticed, 1982 is Information Technology Year. There's a Minister of Information Technology, and the government's even spending a great deal of money on publicising it. But what is information technology? All it really means is the world of computers. But why have they suddenly become so important, and what should we as non-computer experts know about them? Well, that's exactly what I shall be finding out during this series. One thing I know already, don't expect the computer revolution to happen tomorrow. It's happening now. It's craftwork. They use the uh, craftwork of Peter Ball as the music. And, and the BBC computer even had like an owl logo on it, which was based on the on TV program. They had this, this owl. Which is so amazing. <laughs> into some sort of, I was watching it, it was just some sort of bizarre thing about Stonehenge, but that's the British TV program about computers for you. Meanwhile, another computer was being designed and um, launched in the UK which was actually cheaper than the BBC. I think the BBC computer was about £399. This came in much cheaper, under £200. Um, and it was called Sinclair Spectrum. Now, this computer, so like, you know, when I was growing up, like, you had a BBC, and it had to sort of, you know, you'd be learning to program on it, or you'd be doing games on it. But this was a really cool games machine. And like my friend Mark Nixon down the road, I used to go down, he had Spectrum, and he had loads of really cool games. And um, Sinclair did a really good job of getting this to market and out, out into the market. They had, I think they had quite a lot of reliability issues and stuff, but um, it, was a, it, was a, it was the right product priced at the right time, which, I mean, in any market really matters. But yeah, this was good. So I've got another comedy video. Hello, everyone. If the internet would like to work, please. This, there's no history of the internet in this talk, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's somebody else's problem. <coughs> oh, come on, you stupid thing. <laughs> oh, we're there. So this is an ad for the Sinclair Spectrum. It's just a bit more early 80s festival, not that basically. It's going to go, it's just YouTube sometimes, you know, it's just, it can decide when it, sometimes it wants to play stuff, sometimes it doesn't, it'll probably play an ad now. Oh, here we go. This is why I've never, for an external presentation, do use YouTube. But I took the chance internally here because I thought our network would be all right. Oh, never mind. Anyway, come see me later if you want to see this one. This one, it's really good. No, it's not playing. Oh, 
Okay, so the spectrum in the UK was, I think for me, it was like a, the, the BBC and spectrum thing really meant that there was an entire generation of kids that had computers in their house, in their homes, and that they could start to learn to program on them. And I think it's why we've got a really good developer community in the UK. Most British computer programmers that you know, grew up like hacking these things. And, I th and one of the things, I, I know a lot of really interesting people in the UK who are really keen that young people get back to hacking computers again instead of it all just being, you know, treating them as finished products that they go off and, you know, use Microsoft Office on. And a lot of British education to do with computers over the last five to ten years has been about teaching kids to use Microsoft Office rather than actually teaching kids how to untangle a computer and create a new one out of it that can do things that we haven't thought of yet. And this, 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 this really primed a generation on that. Oh no, here we go. It's back. No, it's not. I'll stop that. Right. Now you're going to notice quite a lot of Apple in here. There's two reasons for that. One is that I work for Apple. So I've got more stories about it. But um, the other is that um, the products have been really significant. Um, so I showed you that picture of the IBM PC before, yeah, that big clunky thing with the, the two floppy drives. In 1984, having uh, Apple had been trying to come up with something to replace the Apple II with for a long time. And it had this thing called the Apple Lisa, which it tried first, which had a very radical kind of way of controlling the screen. Because when you had the IBM PC, you had to type everything as a key, uh, you know, type in what you wanted to do in a sort of, it's called MS-DOS, and it was all instructions. <laughs> the same with the BBC computer. We run this, can't return, whatever. But um, Apple had been experimenting. It all came out of this place called Xerox Park in the 70s. There had been some radical experiments going on to look at how you could control a computer with... Uh, something in your hand, and this, this nobody had ever done, looked at this before, and it was really radical. How would you lay out um, information on the screen? And the idea of having things in windows that you could organise around a screen. The idea of your screen being like a desktop. This was a very radical idea. So Apple launched a product, a product called the Lisa, first, and there's a very funny ad for it if you ever Google it. Um, it's got Kevin Costner in it, looking very young. Um, but it was too expensive and it just didn't get moving. So what they decided to do was redesign the Lisa as something uh, much leaner and simpler. Um, and what they launched was called the Macintosh. And it was launched in 1984. Now I'm hoping this video will work. Because um, they launched it on, in a, a famous ad um, yeah. at the Super Bowl. You are very correct. I'll just see if I can get this going because there are some good things. The day we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification. <laughs> right, so this was a famous ad that was that was screened in the um, at the Super Bowl um, Super Bowl weekend in um, um, 1984. Um, it's the beginning of 1984, um, but I'm not sure if it's going to play ball at all. I'm afraid. Sorry. Any ideas? Can I get on my wide network? No, because you've got an Yeah, no, we've got an adapter. Um, sorry about that. I'll check. Being able to talk about the history of computers doesn't guarantee I can use them. <laughs> I'll switch to the 5 gig. Well, okay, let's see what happens now. <coughs> Glorious 
went on to launch the Macintosh, which, which was a very interesting product. Um, uh, you know, and very promising, but actually it didn't really take off in the market to the degree that they'd hoped it would. And they ended up with terrible inventory problems and style, and it, was, it all got a bit messy. But the product itself was extremely important in the development of the computers that you know now. Most of the principles to which computers operate that you, you use on a desktop are rooted in, in this product. Or a bit, this product took lots of ideas from other places and just put them together really well. Um, so meanwhile, the IBM side of the industry was going, well, what are we going to do? This is, was it Intel as well. Um, I remember I talked about that um, 8086 processor before. By, by 1986, they had a 80386 processor, which was really powerful and actually very cheap. Um, well, not that cheap, but sort of relatively cheap. And what started to happen was that the development of um, IBM-compatible PCs. Now, probably the most important company in this industry at the time was Compaq. Um, Compaq was Texan, I think. Um, I think it's based in Austin. I might be wrong. But um, what they did was they just built really good quality computers um, and um, targeted business, the business market really well. I, I was lucky enough, I, I, I knew the, um, the founder of the UK division of it. There was this, this sort of the legendary Joe McNally. And he, he once talked to me about how the key thing was that Compaq knew how it, it, it was very clever because it knew that if it wanted to sell computers at a massive scale, you had to build really great relationships with the dealer network, a sales channel, so that you could do it. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, the 1% club. How much can you sell? How, how much can you reach out yourself versus how much do you have to use local agents to sort of build out your market? And Compaq did a really good job of, of building an indirect reseller channel for its computers and investing in it and supporting it really well. So basically anybody that was shipping Compaq computers to businesses was really profitable and really successful and everything went all out on time. So this was a really significant product. Boring as hell, but it just ran office productivity applications. So by 1986, you're starting to see the end of the typing pool, which, which should, you know, previously, everything would have been sent to the typist department, you know, the typists to get turned into a memo or whatever. But this computer really meant that, that people up to middle ranking executive level were using computers themselves. And it would it would end up being this point, you know, the idea of somebody in an office not using a computer now is very unusual. And this was really the computer that sort of started that era. Okay, so I'm gonna skip on a few years. Um, this this was, um, I, I had one of these when I went to work for Apple in Poland. I went to Warsaw, I was based out there. Now, um, Apple meanwhile did, some really interesting thinking about the laptop computer. Now, portable computers, before, this is the Macintosh PowerBook, um, which was launched in 1991. Now, before this, I just wish I had an example to show you. So, I used to have, in our compact photo library in London, we used to have some great photos of Joe McNally, the founder of that. He, he used to, early on in that company, that they used to deliver, ta he used to deliver computers via London cabs to people, which is obviously not, um, business you can scale but it was um 
He used to turn up with a portable computer. Compaq had one of the first portables, but it was like a suitcase with a big handle on the top. And you'd kind of swing it around and, and you'd kind of start to assemble it out. And sort of, it was just like this crazy thing. It was a PowerBook 170. I've got one in the London office, actually, um, which I don't think it works now. But it's, um, it, was, it was basically recognisable, this form. What, what Apple did was it did things like it moved the keyboard to the back, but nobody had ever done that before. And it put this thing in here, which is like a little ball. It's like a track. It's called a trackball. And, I mean, you all have these kind of touch pads now. And, it's, again, it's the roots of that design uh, in this product. Um, and it was actually, you know, it, it, it's still the thing is it still didn't communicate. You had a portable computer, but you sat on it typing or, or working on a spreadsheet. It, it wasn't connected to other things. Um, but this had a fax modem so you could send email and you could plug it in via basic networking to use email as well. But email, it was very early days for email, 1991. Um, but I had one of these. And it was, it was pretty cool, actually, especially in Warsaw in 1993. Speaking of 1993, um, there'd been all this, the, the, like, there's a whole story of what happened at Apple after the Mac and how Steve Jobs got pushed out by um, a, a, a guy called John Scully, who he had hired in from Coca-Cola um, or, or Pepsi or Coca-Cola. On the, on the premise of, well, what do you want to do? Sell sugared water for the rest of your life or change the world? Um, so he came in, but it actually ended up, the board pushed Steve Jobs out. And there was a whole er period of time when the company was run differently. And this is John Scully's product. It's called the Apple Newton. Now, you probably look at that and think it's a smartphone. Yeah, the only difference is, this is like, it's like about that big. And the battery would last a couple of hours. So okay, I had really? one of these in Poland. And I remember taking it out and showing it to all my friends at dinner. And by the time it got around the table, <laughs> the battery had gone through. <laughs> <laughs> it had been fully charged at the start. And it didn't, it didn't have rechargeable batteries then. It just had, you had to buy, you know, like all these AA <laughs> batteries and put them in the back. Um, and it was, what it was trying to do was get to grips with this idea of a portable handheld computer, like a personal digital assistant at the time. And um, it's, I, I've got a video of this. <laughs> it settles down a sec. things really. I think the part that excites me the most has to do with helping people keep in touch. The idea behind Newton is that it's an assistant, something that actively helps you as you capture, organize, and communicate your ideas and information. The possibilities are just limitless. When you think about it, the most natural way to get your thoughts down is a jot or a sketch. We wanted Newton to be that natural. Say you're on a train or a plane or at a little cafe. You can write a fax. Say you want to send that fax to Margaret. You just highlight Margaret's name in the text. Tap fax. Newton will automatically <laughs> fill out a fax cover sheet with Margaret's number on it. We've built in Newton intelligence so that Newton knows enough about what you're trying to do to help you do it. This was incredibly radical at the time. You take it for granted. The beauty of Newton is that any page you have in your Newton can be sent through email. Text, graphics, pages from your calendar, business cards. You just select email and, well, you send it. Simple as that. I wasn't that it seems to happen all the time these days. You're expecting a really important message, but you can't guarantee you're going to pull it reach. By just getting the Newton messaging card, you can get your message wherever you go. You can share anything that's in your Newton with anyone else. Using Newton's built-in infrared networking capability, you can beam things to other people. It's pretty handy <laughs> to just be able to send someone something instantly business card or the notes or a calendar page you can even jot notes to jog your memory later or set an alarm or add a task to your to-do list kind of a communication center or universal inbox and outbox the 
the Newton Connection Kit lets you connect your Newton to your PC or your Macintosh and share and store information. This is all about being in charge of your life, being able to have information so you can keep in touch with people. It's going to help you keep track of your time and your contacts, but it's going to do it in a way that's not intrusive to your lifestyle. I'd say that Newton is really peace of mind, right in the palm of your hand. Um, I've got an original poster ad of this actually, which I should be able to put up somewhere here. It's got your well, your Newton. It's got like this sort of a guy carrying a baby on his back, and then the Newton is kind of in a spare pocket on the baby carrier. And, I mean, it was. You can tell from. I mean, this is a good example of the marketing that's all over the place. It didn't know what it wanted to do. It was trying to explain too much. It was trying to explain all these ideas to people of what you can do with this product. And it was trying to be everything um, way before the market could understand that. Um, and it, it didn't really take off. It had, um, well, it didn't take off. Um, there were a lot of problems with the handwriting recognition, which did improve over the life of the product. But I mean, I was you know, demoing it to people, especially if you passed it around the table then the poor thing would get so confused about all these different people's handwriting that it would just be a complete disaster. And they would go, this is rubbish. And um, it, it, was, it was just, it was too early, too ahead of its time. And I think sometimes, you know, when all of us who are working in technology, you've got to understand when the right moment, when it's the right moment to, to bring certain technologies to market. And you need to let other people make the mistakes of taking it to market first, too early. You don't want to get into that business. You need to leave other people to do it. Or certainly not punish them for taking it to market too early. Now, speaking of taking products to market too early, this is one of the products that I helped launch in 1994. Um, can anybody guess what it is? Projector. Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, projector, I was thinking. Anybody else? It's a digital camera. Yeah. <laughs> it was the Apple QuickTake 100 digital camera. And um, these had, it was launched in 1994. The QuickTake 100 had an introductory price of 749 US dollars. And it could hold, I think, 30, 16 photographs, or maybe 32. <laughs> in certain situations. So we're trying to launch this in a world that at the time was, I mean, one of the things, the big, if I say to you, what's the big thing outside in any, any town or city, especially tourist towns, that's changed visibly over the last 15 to 20 years? It's actually that there's, you no longer have all these Kodak and Agfa and Fujifilm logos everywhere. They used to be everywhere. And you could always tell a tourist spot because of all the Agfa and Fuji logos. Um, but when we were launching this, the, I mean, it was an enormous industry of film processing and analog cameras in place. And we're, we're like saying to people, so yeah, it's this digital camera, it's great. And people go, well, why would I want a camera that costs um, $749 that can only take pictures that are in the camera? Well, what am I going to do with them? Well, you could put them on your computer. Well, what am I going to do with them on my computer? I mean, you really did. People would say stuff like this. Is that, well, I'd rather take them to the film developer and get them printed off. And it was like, ah. So um, even we didn't really understand what this was about. But if you think how digital photography is, is just pervasive everywhere now, and people don't go around going, Oh, I don't want this digital camera. I, I, you know, because what am I going to do with the photos? Like, but people really felt that then. So um, that was funny. I mean, just before that, we well, actually about the same time we launched something called QuickTime, which was um, uh, little yeah you know, videos plays videos. Well, the sort of kind of videos that you have on these computers. And people were saying we launched these AV Max that had speakers on the front, and they could play MP3. Um, tracks and they could play quick time movies and people said well why would I want to play a little little video on my computer screen and you could only go make them a like about that big 
And they go, oh, well, why would I want to play a music track on the computer? I, I'm, I'm too busy typing documents. And you couldn't explain any of this at the time. We didn't really understand how all of this would meld together into what we now have, which is, I mean, my, I don't know, I'm sure yours is the same, but you know, my world is full of receiving digital images that have been captured on something like this, shared over the internet, and Adrian can present about the issue, history of the internet sometime, just for a laugh. <laughs> um, and, and all of the stuff that came with it. Right, um, just a couple more things. Uh, I think this is the point where marketing really improved in the computer business. I mean, all that stuff before you see with speechy ads and everything are quite funny, but they're not that good apart from the Super Bowl ad. Um, I really like this campaign from 1996. So um, it's called What's on Your Power Book? And um, Apple did it, and it was like, it featured different people. So you can't probably can't see it. So far, far the uh, damn doll priest. So what's on your power book? So it was what's on your laptop? Um, and then Todd Rungry, interactive artist, and the, it's got a list of the, you know, the dates of my concert tour, songs I've written, computer programs I've written, uh, da, 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 some good stuff. And then they had um, a couple more. You know, th this one's really funny. Uh, Tama Janovitz, author, and then uh, Francis, uh, innovator, and like you know, completely with the pooch down here and stuff. And it's like, what kind of things would you have on your on your power book? And it was really trying to get into the um, idea of how computers were very personal um, and, and um, more, more independent, more outside of the company world. And it was only, I mean, it was still another 10 to 15 years before computers really did get out of the corporate. You know, you, most people here um, would have always used a computer that their company had bought for them. But now you, you often use your own devices as well. And that's new. But this was a sort of starting to understand that trend. And there was another one. <laughs> Bike messenger stroke screen writer. Oh, he's actually on a skateboard. Oh, that's actually fashion, not, not him being really big. So, I mean, there's a lot of other things that went on in the computer industry, but I, I just wanted to highlight just a couple more. Um, this was 1997, and Steve Jobs had come back to Apple a couple of years before. And he, just at about that time, they had some, there was some interesting new technology coming together. And at that point, the, the whole computer PC had got quite bloated. Um, Microsoft Windows had won the battle of who controlled desktop. And Windows 98 is really, it was the era. Windows 95, 98, that was the area that Microsoft won. Um, but what, what Jobs did with, with the iMac was rethink it and really simplify it in radical ways using the technology of the time. So it still had a, it had a CD drive, but it always had a CD drive, which was, you know, pretty new at the time, but didn't have floppy disks anymore. And people go, oh, my floppy disk drive, what am I going to do? And it's like, well, get over it, get with the program. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it had just incredible industrial design. And, and we have a few of these in the London office still. So if you, um, but if you have never seen one, it's a, it's a it's a thing of beauty because you can see into it. And at the time, they still had these CRT, the old cathode cathode ray tube displays, and which are you know horrible things from an environmental perspective. Very good quality picture, better than LCD panels actually. But they they, they made it translucent, so you could look in and you could see all of the the machinery. Uh, which was, was beautiful. It also really pushed USB, and it had a, a 56K modem, so it had a dial up automatically. You could always plug a modem into here. So it was very forward looking in terms of understanding the way that people would work in the years to come. Um, but this idea, you know, so no more beige box, um, and just really simplified everything. So, uh, and had speakers built in as well, and stuff. And then, now this one, this is, I got, I have one of these. I'll never forget the day I bought my, bought, got my titanium PowerBook G4. Mm -hmm. Now this, this computer is pretty much what everything, industrial design wise, everything we see now, in terms of where it's at with laptops. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just incredibly thin, 
beautifully designed and made of titanium. And it was just the sexiest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the most exciting thing I've ever done was open the box of my titanium G4 in my living room. Like, <gasps> I just stood staring at it. <laughs> Now, just a couple more. Um, everything starts to unravel as, in terms of personal computing through the noughties, really. Um, but in good ways, because everything had got really staid and stuffy and people were still sitting at desktops going, oh, well, I need to finish this office document before I can send an email to Zunza. And, and it was only things like so the iPod really treating the computer as a centre for music, but then creating a portable device that you could go away with. And it, I can't explain how significant this was as a way of sort of somehow unlocking the computer with something more than just, um, than just being about productivity. Um, and it was very radical industrial design-wise as well. It's really good, really worth reading up on the story of it because they put it together quite quickly. There was a company called Portal Player that they worked with to do it. They, the, the interface design of the iPod was extremely radical in terms of how you navigated music. And to be honest, I still prefer it to going like that, because like that, you have to go like Whereas this is more sort of nicer. So one of the things that I would advise is if you ever want to just get somebody a present as a sort of investment, buy them an iPod Classic, one of the ones they sell now. Keep it shrink-wrapped. Give it, wrap it up as well, give it to them and just say, keep this for 30 years and it'll be worth a lot more. Um, so, and then things unravel really quickly, I think. Um, the sort of end of that era of windows and mice and stuff, I mean, it's going to be around for years, but was the launch of the iPhone and then the development of the Android operating system, which is basically a clone of, of this. So rather like IBM, well, rather like Microsoft eventually developed Windows, which copied the Mac, Macintosh environment with the mice and the windows. Android copied this, this, this thing. Now, when Apple launched this, they were very clever. They launched a, a phone, but they also launched um, an iPod. It was called the iPod Touch. And it, because it was too much for people to get their head around having all this stuff in one device at the time. So they, was, they, was, they would sell you the, the iPhone or the iPod Touch and you could kind of, but it, they were both running the same operating system. So they were able to just develop one operating system for two, two products. And a lot of people didn't really understand the significance of that at the time, but, but basically this allowed Apple to really develop a very modern kind of system that kept everything separate in terms of software. Um, so it was much more stable, much more designed for low power and all that sort of stuff. Um, and eventually, um, what they were able to do, because, of the invest because they were making money selling iPhones, was they were able to launch the same product, basically, in a different size. And now we've got these kind of touch touch pad devices like um, iPads and, and you know all the Google Nexus and all that sort of stuff. Everything, I mean, the, the whole PC thing is over. I mean, we will still sit at computers sometimes, and we'll still use laptop computers, things. But this this stuff is has has won, um, and um, I think that's kind of well, that's probably enough really. Has anybody got any questions? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it's more of a, a, a comment. So I remember when the iPad came out, there was no market for my iPad. Nobody had any idea what anybody was going to use one of these for. And tablet computers, touchscreen tablets, have been out for 10 years before. Yeah. Um, and basically, as far as I'm aware, and Apple just took the money they had from iPhone and hoped for the best. Kind of said, well, you know, we, we launched the iPod and everybody used it. Nobody. Nobody wanted my iPod before iPods around. Nobody wanted a, a t an iPad yeah. until they're around, and yeah, they got lucky. But uh, when you look at the early tablets, oh, they're, they're, kind terrible, of, they? they're kind of small laptops with a really uh, trying to a, a kind of simplified Windows interface. 
but they were completely useless. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that was different about this, because I just think they were well, they timed, you could say it's an accident, well, there's two arguments about this, you could say, either it's an accident or it's well timed. And yeah. you know, it, you can never, never prove either. But I'd say it was well timed. But the, the thing about the iPad is that it's all about what you watch or what you consume rather than you kind of pecking into a keyboard and trying to create documents. And I think gradually we're getting used to this idea that computers are more about how we absorb what's happening around us. We haven't shifted work-wise to deal with this yet. It's still in most, biz most companies, it's unacceptable to sit watching a video at work. What's she doing watching that video? She'd be doing some proper work. But you know, the video might be communicating something very relevant. I mean, I could sit watching videos all day in my job and it is actually relevant. But we, we still have problems with this whole kind of thing. But I think the iPad makes it really easy to absorb content. And it's, it, it's essentially that shift. I mean, I've just bought myself my own personal computer, my own laptop for home. And I've noticed the difference is massive. My work computer is about my productivity input. And my home laptop, yeah, is for the media programs, music, but it's, games, it's much more around what I get out of it. But it's the size of this. I mean, remember those big computers I was talking about before? I mean, look at that. It's, I mean, it's like something from outer space. Looks like a Newton. It, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like something from outer space in comparison. And it's so powerful. And the battery lasts all day, you know, eight hours or something. I mean, these things are brilliant. Yeah, but um, ten years from now, people will laugh about this thing, eh? Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure. I can put. I think. It. I, I think the interfaces. Yeah. But, so what, what would, yeah, what but will you can't get. But, like, look at that. I mean, what are you going to do after that? Go into antimatter or something? I mean, Google glasses. Yeah, wearable. Yeah. Wearable computers. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a great believer. You know, I'm always espousing the idea that offices will have walls that are like giant iPads. Because, you know, engineers tend to be good at two things. One is making existing things cheaper and smaller, or making existing things cheaper and bigger. Um, so that's what most engineers like doing. So I could easily see a situation where we have a lot of the interfaces in this build, in this room, or you're, you know, downstairs or whatever, are sort of feeding content. What we haven't done yet is develop operating systems for an environment that is almost entirely screens. How would you work with that? How would you put content? on display, all of that's still to be worked out. We're kind of looking at some of that back though, but it's, you know, it's only partly our job. But maybe in 10 years from now they, they will laugh about screens. Could do, yeah. Because I was reading, you have this shirt that uh, measures if you're too stressed or how your running performance is doing. There's no screen in it. Well, I think there's an argument as well that technology, you know, much a really unobtrusive technology is the way forward. I mean, the place I'm living in Amsterdam, it's, it's like a, it's a lovely apartment that's sort of owned by an artist who lives downstairs, and it's there's no there's hardly any technology there as we would see. It's not wired up with cables everywhere. It's just you know a simple old old Philips CRT widescreen telly, and then just a little stereo up there. And it's lovely. Instead of all this subwoofers and rubbish. I have this Logitech boombox, which is a little lovely thing that I just carry around with me and just play it from my phone. So, anything else? Any questions? One more? Go on. Somebody can say something. Luke. <laughs> think about Nairobi. <coughs> you, you, you spend all that time in Nairobi, and everybody's obsessed with smartphones now. Yeah, that's right. That's what, so I, I'm, I mean, tablets are also dropping price in, in Kenya, especially the Android. But it could be that just like they skipped the phone, they might skip the iPad as well. <laughs> could be. I mean, I think the thing. The thing. The thing is, what's the mainstream? What does main? What do mainstream people do with computers, and how's that changed over the years? A lot of the time, they've cal done calculations on them. They've written documents on them, or they've created presentations on them. Um, and I, it's shifting now to, I mean, we're using phones to data collection. It, you know, the, a smartphone is a computer, and it's being used for data collection. But, and smartphones are used by most people every day to express what 
they're doing what they had a feeling. I always remember I did I was working with the director, the head of design at Hewlett Packard about 2006, writing some articles for Business Week on design, and um, this guy Sam Lucente, very cool guy, um, ponytail, very laid back, really deep voice. I used to go into meetings and. After about 20 minutes, I'd slowed down to his pace, but it took that long. And we talked about how, he said, in just a few years' time, this is 2006, just a few years' time, most young people will be actively managing their own PR, their own image online every day. Right. And that sounded insane. It was like, whoa, whoa. But of course, that's what happens now. Yeah. Most young people around the world are just are constantly managing their own identity externally. And that's all come through smartphones. That didn't happen with personal computers in that way. So I think you know, this, this different era will bring different ways that we use computers to do things. So, yeah. Maybe the next uh, break to freedom is uh, like the IBM thing. It's not that we work for the computer, but the computer starts working for us. Yeah. Because sometimes we are still a slave of the. Oh yeah, machine. I'm actually. I think at some point in time, and, and it's going to be over the next year or two. I'm just going to have a month or two where I don't use any computers or any smartphone or anything, and see what it's like, and see if everybody else or my colleagues, well, we'll see if I get fired. <laughs> <laughs> we did it once in the company I used to work. We said, as an experiment, we said, okay, let's not use a computer for one day. And everybody was really like nervous in the beginning of the day. What should we do? Should we talk to each other? Or <laughs> it was really weird. But my, um, my friend talk? Judy, she was <laughs> sort of like kind of my ethereal great aunt. She was, she says, I've been thinking it's all about life beyond the screen. You have to not be looking into screens all the time. It's got to be about other things. Mm -hmm. I kind of think she's right. Why? Sorry. Why? <laughs> 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 well, screens are just. Yeah. It, you're always waiting for something else to appear on the screen. There's, there's something about that. No, no, I don't wait for things. I make things appear on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the... Yeah, it's just about, you're just a control freak, basically. Yeah. Um, but you can ask it yourself sometimes. Anyway, um, thank you, everybody.